Uh, greetings, everyone. It's a blessing to see everyone here. It's nice to have a new venue here where we're actually in a coffee house this time for the Catholic Coffee House. So hopefully you got a chance to uh, enjoy some of the, uh, the free Gianna's coffee, or if you got some specialty stuff, that's great, too. Um, I just want to start off by giving everyone a very warm welcome to this year's coffee house. One of the things we try to focus on is what it is to be a pilgrim in faith. That's to say a pilgrim, someone who's journeying, someone who's traveling. And one of the things that we Catholics do to highlight this dimension of our life of faith is we go on pilgrimages. We go on pilgrimages to discover God in a deeper way. We go on pilgrimages to receive special graces that the Lord has in store for each of us. And these graces are sometimes very strong and impact our life. But anytime someone goes on pilgrimage, they receive something typically not just for themselves, but also for others. And so we're hoping that through this year of the coffee house, people can offer their stories, offer their experiences of pilgrimage so that those graces can be shared in a wider way. And so that's why our theme this year is rediscovering faith through pilgrimage. And tonight we have a very special speaker and a good friend of mine, Jeff Schoenstock, who's went on, who just went on the World Youth Day pilgrimage to Krakow. And this is an awesome place because not only the experience of the universal church there, when the Pope coming with all the young people, but also the rich Polish history there, the rich experience of God's mercy amid sufferings, the awesome history of the great John Paul II. And so I want to give the mic over to Jeff Schoenstock to share this awesome pilgrimage that he went on with uh, so many young people from the Diocese of Lincoln. Let's give it for Jeff. Thank you, Father. Uh, why don't we go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, we were made to return to you. Our life is a pilgrimage, and you call us at times to make special pilgrimage here as a reminder of that. You have shown us that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Help us to follow that way. Help us to seek your truth, and help us to live abundantly in you. We ask all this, Lord, as together we give you praise and glory. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I also want to thank Giannis. Um, it looks like a ton of people here. I like this. Uh, nice and tight. We can, And lots of friends, too. Um, several friends that I've been on pilgrimage with. I see some friends from the March for Life pilgrimage. I see some friends that went with me to Krakow, and... That means I'm going to have to tell the truth. <laughs> I see friends that went with me to the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia. Uh, I see my wife and our baby, and we've gone lots of places together. Uh, <clears throat> St. Teresa's, all sorts of fun places. So um, I just I wanted to talk for a while about pilgrimage itself, about the Christian life. But Father Heaslip introduced me um, for a couple reasons, I think I'm here, mostly because I'm the office next to his, and he needed somebody. Um, but also, the Office of Evangelization is the sponsor of this night, and so I wanted to look at pilgrimage through the lens of evangelization, and what that is and how they work together. And I think we get a good answer for that in the last thing Jesus tells us. In the Gospel of Matthew, just before he ascends into heaven, the Great Commission, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No big deal. Last thing Jesus told us. Four things. Go, make, teach, baptize. First thing you got to do is something the Holy Father told us while we were at the vigil the night before the Mass, and millions of us out in the field being friends together, and he's giving us a talk, and what does he say? you got to get off the couch. He's telling the young people, 
you can't do anything if you don't go. You're playing too many video games. You're sitting next to each other and sending text messages. Get up. Go. And make. Make disciples. That's the key part of the whole message. You cannot make disciples unless you become a disciple. You must live the life of a Christian and make it something worth imitating. And to live the Christian life is completely imitatable. Like, that's why we have saints. Because the church holds them up as something worthy of imitation, something glorious and amazing that we should want to attain. We shouldn't pick saints because they're out here. We should pick saints because we want to go there. So go and make and teach. There were so many things that Jesus taught us. We're going to go through some of it this evening as we keep going. And baptize. And normally we think, oh, Father Kelly, that's your job. Father Hesop, that's your job. That takes us down to three. No. We're supposed to bring people into the Christian family. Now, maybe they're the ones that pour the water and say the words most of the time. But it's our job to go and make and teach. And when we do that, people want to come and be baptized and brought together as part of the Christian family. What does that have to do with pilgrimage? Because as we're going to discuss tonight, pilgrimage is the Christian life. Not going to Poland, that's fantastic, but going to Poland is a representation of the journey of us trying to go to heaven. That's why we're here. And that's why we go to Poland. Now maybe it's not why all the kids signed up to go to Poland. It's not. But some. And we had several meetings going into it to discuss, why are we here? I'm going to go shopping in Europe. Lots of that, right? We're all tempted by that sort of thing. I am. Right before the plane ride home, I realized I need to go shopping because I didn't get anybody anything. But honey, that chocolate was not from the airport. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> There's a reason we go. It's not a vacation. And so we look back to these are the four things Christ told us that we must do. And let's look at that teach all that I have commanded you, because that's what I think is the Christian life. And where does that happen? I want to stay in the Gospel of Matthew and start back at chapter 5. This is a people the people of God who have been in exile for 700 years. Think about that. Think about all the anxiousness we have about this particular election. And then consider a people in exile for 700 years. Think about that suffering. Think about that waiting. Think about that desire because they had been promised by a God who they saw work miracles over and over and over again. They knew he was true. They knew he was powerful and the stories had come down and they're ready. And then comes this man who's doing miracles and up the mountain he goes and all of them follow. Thousands and thousands of people. And they are so ready because it's time. The Messiah who's been promised is here, the Son of God. Who else had been called Son of God? King David. The highlight on earth of the, the Jewish people. And he gets up there, and they're so ready for him to say, Blessed are you faithful people. It's time to make this happen. We're going to war. And we got this, right? Right? Because before, all that had to happen, Moses held his hands up and they won. Wouldn't that be a great way to fight a war? <laughs> and here's this guy who's done more than Moses and who teaches with authority like Moses, and they're ready for that. And he looks at him and he says, 
Blessed are the peacemakers. What? Blessed are the meek. Um, You're giving the wrong talk, Jesus. What are you doing? This isn't what we came for. Are you the Messiah? You just turned a few fish and loaves into baskets full of extras, so there's something about you. What is going on? And so he teaches them. And then he goes on. And the next chapter in Matthew 6, he begins to teach them about fasting and almsgiving and prayer and how you should do it and how we should go about it. And why is he doing that? He's setting some stuff up, right? But he's also teaching them about how we're supposed to go about that part of the life of a Christian. And chapter 7, this weird, weird things happen. Well, actually, back in chapter 6, weird things happen because he's like, how do you pray? Our Father. Mind blown. Because you're the Son of God, and if he's our Father, then I'm a son, and you're daughters, and we're the children of God. That's a more intimate relationship than they had ever had or could ever have hoped for. So twice now, he's blown their minds, not including the miracle of changing what they're looking for and then giving them a blessing they never could have hoped for. And then he says, chapter 7, ask, and you shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock. And the door shall be opened. Is that anybody's experience of prayer? Okay. I'm a junior in high school. It's 1993. And I'm on my knees. Because, God, I'm driving a 1976 lime green Pontiac Le Mans. And this ain't working. And you told me to ask. I'm asking. Still drove that car in my senior year. <laughs> what are you doing, God? Seek. I looked at all sorts of cars. No. Knock. I guess I could have wrecked it. <laughs> but really, that, that's not our experience of prayer, is it? Generally, no. Ask and you shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. No. This isn't my experience of prayer. And as a young man, this really, really messed with my faith. Okay, you're God. You can do everything. You can't lie to me. You say this is true. This hasn't happened. Are you real? What are you talking about, God? But remember what I said earlier. This is a people in exile for 700 years. And they're not sitting still. They're making holy pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem regularly. We see two examples of it in the joyful mysteries, right? The presentation. The holy family comes. St. Joseph and Our Lady present Jesus in the temple. Several years later, the finding in the temple. What is going on there? I love Our Lady. She was sinless. She, she's perfect, right? She's wonderful, but she did sort of lose God in the biggest part of the biggest city in the whole culture. <laughs> For days. When I was a kid, my mom lost me in Walmart a couple times. <laughs> she always found me in the toy section or by the baseball cards. But that was for like five minutes. Our Lady lost Jesus for days. How did that happen? Because huge caravans went together to the holy city to make sacrifice, bring sacrifices for the priests to make in the temple. 
cousins, friends, they think Jesus is with all these other people, and they begin to realize, oh, he's not here. Now, my point in all this is to just show you how regular a thing this is. And so when the people on the mountain hear Jesus say, ask, seek, knock, they are a pilgrim people who know in pilgrimage language, how do you do this? Well, you go to somebody who's been there before and you ask, how do I get to the city? And once they've told you, you seek the city. And when you get there, Jerusalem has this huge wall all the way around it. Little gate in the back, big gate in the front. And you get there and you knock. Jesus is telling them in Matthew 7, you are a pilgrimage people. You understand pilgrimage. I'm telling you, you don't understand it well enough because there's a new Jerusalem, a greater Jerusalem, that is our constant thing we're seeking. That's where we're going. Keep making the trip to the holy city. But I'm telling you, ask, seek, knock for the journey to heaven. And later he tells us, when you ask, you're asking the way, I'm the way. The truth and the life. And that's where we get our pilgrimage culture. Because we are a pilgrim people. Well, I'm the youth minister for the diocese. What does youth ministry have to do with this? And so I thought I would tell you what the goals of youth ministry are from the bishops of America. In the late 70s, they put together a document called A Vision for America. And like many things from the 70s, it needed to be updated. Much like my Pontiac Le Mans. The thing was hideous. Um, in 1994, they redid the document and called it Renewing the Vision. Three simple goals. This is why we do youth ministry. To empower young people to live as disciples of Jesus Christ in our world today. To draw young people to responsible participation in the life, mission, and work of the Catholic faith community. To foster the total personal and spiritual growth of each young person. I'm not getting all that done. The church isn't getting all that done. All of us aren't getting all that done. We're making our efforts, right? And these are our goals. And to make this totally consistent with the church, I can only see this as me and other youth ministries doing this as an assistance to parents who are the primary educators of young people. But these are daunting things to empower young people to live as disciples of Jesus Christ in our world today. I, I'm happy if they show up to start, okay? And we kind of want one thing to happen to make them want to show up again and work down the path. Oh, what's the next thing? To draw young people. Okay, we just want them to show up. To responsible participation in the life mission and work of the church. I thought we just had pizza. Right? That's what we often think of with youth ministry. And then finally, to foster the total personal and spiritual growth of each young person. And we tend to think of that as, well, I'm at St. James and it's my job to run sixth grade CCD for the sixth graders at St. James. This is not what the church is saying. The church is saying for each young person. Our parish boundaries aren't the parish boundaries for the Catholics. No, it's every soul there. Every single one we are called to go make teach and baptize, each and every single one. And we're not, we're not good at this. I'm not good at this. What do I want to do when I get home after hanging out with my wife and my kids? I want to talk to my neighbors that I see who are parents in my kids' class and who I see at Mass because I know them and we share something. 
That's not the fullness of evangelization. That's not the fullness of what we're called to in youth ministry. That's not why we go on pilgrimage. There's always another step and another step and another soul that we're called to. Well, why do I bring that up? How do we in youth ministry do those things? I think in three ways. And I think it's the three ways that Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The first is catechesis. It's what I'm doing right now. It's your religion classes. It's so many things Father Heeslip does through the religious education department. It's what Father does when he preaches at Mass. It's sharing the faith, spreading the faith, the teachings of the faith. And we do a lot of that in youth ministry. The second thing is retreat. Well, if you notice in chapter 6, what does Jesus say? When you pray, do it in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will see you. Sometimes we're getting overrun. And I always ask the kids, if I go to a school or a God teens night, hey, guys, I run retreats. Anybody know what a retreat is? Uh... Jesus, Uh, anybody else? That's good. (laughs) It's when you go and learn about your faith. Well, thank you for the attitude when you said it. Um, Actually, isn't that what you're doing here in this religion class? Is this a retreat? And there's always one kid who watches too many war movies. He's like, retreats when you run away in battle. And I'm like, yes. Yes. Because it's not running away, it's not cowardice. Retreat is realizing there are more bombs and more bullets than you were ready for. And sometimes, strategically, we need to pull back to a place already decided. Get away from those bombs and get away from those bullets and re-strategize with the ultimate general and get back into the battle. That's what we're doing. That's what a retreat is. And then the third thing in youth ministry that we do is pilgrimage. And again, I I went with several folks to Philadelphia to see our Holy Father there at the World Meeting of Families. It was a fantastic experience. Several friends here uh, have gone with me on the March for Life, and and kids don't understand when I tell them the ask, seek, knock thing. They're like, what does this have to do with saving babies? And I tell them, today, in your culture, more than 3,000 babies never had the chance to see the sun. Today and every day since January 22nd, 1973, we're talking nearly 60 million souls. And so there's a pilgrimage that needs to be done, and you need to ask me how to get there. And after I tell you, you need to get on the bus, and we need to seek justice and hope and mercy. And when we get there, we're going to march all the way up Constitution Avenue to the doors of the Supreme Court where we are going to knock metaphorically. You had to be really careful with that with young people. (laughs) I take 280 kids on the March for Life, and I think they kind of want to bum rush the door. But we have to, and we have to knock, and we have to say, no more. No more can this happen. Not on my watch. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen despite me, not because of me, not because of my silence. And it's a real pilgrimage that represents our real pilgrimage because guess what? Right after he tells us, ask, seek, knock, he says, by the way, seek the narrow gate. For the way is wide that leads to destruction. Go on pilgrimage and take the hard road. Because hard things are going to happen, and our culture isn't the first to face that. And that brings us to World Youth Day. I'm very, very blessed. God loves me. Um, So this was my fourth World Youth Day. When I was a junior in high school, I went to Denver to see John Paul II. That's not true. When I was a junior in high school, I went to Denver because our youth group was going, and the girl-to-guy ratio was 8 to (laughs) 1. 
But then I got there. And I'm from a small town in Kansas. There are about 1,800 people. I grew up on the farm. So seeing well over a million people was a little daunting. And see them going nuts like no football game I had ever seen, like no sporting event I had ever seen, like no concert for any rock and roll star I had ever seen, for this smiling old man opened some doors in my head to say, am I getting this? And no, the things he said at that World Youth Day are some of the most amazing and profound messages to young people ever said to this day. Now, I didn't get them there. I just remember seeing young people, young people of Denver and of the world. And everybody's like, ah, Denver, world, I'm from the world. And I'm just like, wow, all these people are nuts. Be not afraid, cast out into the deep. What is he talking about? And I'll be honest, it, it was an oasis in the desert of my spiritual life. That when it, time came and, and the boat was rocking, that's where I went back to and remembered. And I read some of the things he said there. And it made a big difference in the path that I chose in seeking the narrow gate. Sometimes I hop on the wide road. I like pavement. I've walked all over Europe with these people. Hard roads are hard. Trust me. Miles over those pebbles, you smile through it because you know everybody's hurting. But it's hard. And being with the Holy Father is an experience of universality, of real Catholicity, like nothing else I've ever experienced. So Denver, I was a junior in high school, and then I got the job here, and I started in May, um, a week before Sky Camp and TOTUS Tuas training started. They really buffaloed me on that one. And then Father Eikhoff was like, we can get you in if you want to go to Australia. I said, I do want to go to Australia, but I want to stay married more. So... I just moved my wife and kids here. I'm not even bringing that one up. And so they went to Australia. Father Kelly, you were on that trip, right? Um, and I believe that was Benedict's first, wasn't it? No, no, he, went, he did Germany, so it was his second. Um, but it was an incredible moment for Australia, a place where the faith, to be quite honest, is not being lived well by most of the Catholic population. And that's why he went. He went there to say there's more. You're made for more. You're made for great things. And then he chose Spain. I love Toledo, Spain. I really want to buy a villa there. But I'm a youth minister. So I might run a hostel <laughs> for a couple days. But it is the place most like Lincoln, Nebraska, I've ever been in the world with lots prettier churches. We have some nice churches. These are several hundred years older, and it took hundreds of years to build them. They're amazing. Take your breath away, amazing. But the faith is lived there. That's not true of most of Spain. Spain has become a place that is culturally very, very Catholic, excuse me, ethnically very, very Catholic is how they would say it. And some of them just told me when I would ask, you know, what, why has secularism taken such a grasp? And they said, the faith is in the hearts of the people of Spain, but it is not in our shoes. We don't go. Oh. Boy, they came when the Holy Father came. That night, in Spain, before the Papal Mass, we were in Cuatro Vientros, an old military airport, and we're having a holy hour with the Father, the Holy Father, and he's not there yet. And we had walked about seven miles, 
and it was somewhere around 200 degrees. <laughs> that might be Celsius. Um, it, it was hideous. And they had done so many things right in Spain. The logistics are always something else. But they had done so much right, but boy, they did not have that planned right. And there's no water. You're waiting in line forever to get your meals. And the, the atmosphere of the place is kind of like, oh. oh. Every 30, 40 minutes, you might be near when the fire truck drives by spraying people, and you might catch a couple of drops. It was so hot. And the Holy Father gets there, and he's talking to us, and he's praying with us, and we're wanting to shout like we had done in Denver, but we were like, go, Pope. It's hot. They built you a big awning. It's hot out here. And suddenly you see these clouds out of nowhere just show up. And they start to roll over us. And people's tongues are hanging on the ground at this point. And it just starts to pour. And the people rise up and they were dancing and they were singing and all these cardinals grab umbrellas and they get around the Holy Father and there's this much space and you can see his face and he's just looking at us like these people are crazy <laughs> look at the zeal wow crazy right and Father Joe Faulkner the pastor in Wahoo is next to me and he's like everybody else at this point, they got up, they danced, and now they're getting down, and they're putting all the, the stuff over them, getting all their rain gear on, and hiding under tarps. And he looks, and he shakes his head. He says, farm boys. And I was like, what? He said, there are three million people here, and two of you are standing, you and Father Leo Seeker. <laughs> it felt good. We wanted to watch the rain. And so we'd gone from so tired to so energetic, throwing on the rain stuff. Everybody gets it on and it quits raining. And then the largest monstrance in the world, which is in Toledo, rises up out of the stage with our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity right there in the monstrance. And three million people hit their knees with no command. And we prayed night prayer, evening prayer and night prayer with the Holy Father. And our kids understood the universality of the faith. And then came Rio de Janeiro down in, in Brazil. And it was totally different. There aren't ancient churches there. We saw one really, really beautiful cathedral in Sao Paulo. But mostly, everything there is new. But there is a vibrancy down there of the faith. And there are so many Catholics everywhere that it was incredible to see, and Brazilian people can make a drum out of anything. <laughs> there is so much dancing. And I was okay with that, because they fed you meat at every meal. It was beautiful. I love the food in, in Rio, and I pay way too much attention to the food when I go on these things. And then came Poland. And we're going to go through the trip here a little bit. Uh, I have some pictures. I apologize. It looks like we're going to have a little green coloring if it comes back. So here's my, my simple itinerary. 18 days over in Poland and the Czech Republic. Day one. So we flew out of Omaha, we got to Midway in Chicago, where we got on a bus and went to O'Hare in Chicago, and it's Sunday, so we got to go to Mass, and the chapel at O'Hare is busy, and I'd been working with them for weeks trying to get us in there, and the rules were ridiculous, so our priest said, well, let's just go outside. So here we are at Mass, here we are with our very holy altar, which may or may not be a luggage cart turned upside down with a whole bunch of luggage in it. You improvise on pilgrimage. You, you make do and you go. Almost all these pictures, by the way, are photo credit to Kevin Clark. And we got there. We flew into Warsaw and took a bus to Czestochowa. 
Um, Chestahova is where the Yasnagora Monastery is and the famous icon of Our Lady of Chestahova. Many miracles associated with it. One of the easiest ones to remember if you see her, there are two scratches on her face. Um, the monastery was looted. Most of the monks were killed. They got everything out to the cart, tried to take off, and the horse wouldn't go. The horse refused to go, and they're whipping the horse and whipping the horse, and that horse is not going anywhere. And so one of the, the looters goes and smacks the icon with his sword and cuts her face twice, takes it off, and the horse leaves with all the other stuff. Many, many miracles are associated with it. You'll see it right here. Um, what an amazing opportunity we had there because we got to Chestahova before most pilgrims did. So we got there, we got mass in a side chapel, walked over about 20 feet, and we're alone in the main chapel. Our priest walked right up to the icon and led us in the rosary in front of this beautiful icon. We were able to, to do so many things. There's a huge, beautiful basilica associated with it beautiful music going on, which was true throughout Poland, and we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but it, it was truly incredible. We went from there to a little town called Wadowice, which is the home of John Paul II. So here is the church he's in. Uh, this is a little side chapel, one of our pilgrims here. You'll see a lot of uh, bandanas with us. Here is one of our pilgrims holding the baptismal font where he was baptized and saying prayers. And I believe he's got a few things in his hand that he was trying to, to get a blessing for. And the rest of these are Zacapone. And as I said, sometimes you have to adjust. Um, I had been to Poland the year before to kind of scope things out book our places, things like that. And one of the places I had gone was Zakopane, which is down in the mountains on the southern border. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. But if you get caught in the main square, it's kind of like a state fair all year round. And our guides are telling me, and then we're going to go to Zakopane. And I said, whoa, I know how far that is. Why are we going there? Well, we want to give a peop your people a chance to shop. I was like, I don't. <laughs> that is not what I want at all. Uh, there's a beautiful church there where we're going to say mass. Okay. <laughs> Lady, there are beautiful churches all over Poland. There's one an hour away. We want to go. Okay, Zakopone sounds good. So we drove and we drove and we drove and we got dropped off and we were told, um, you have 30 minutes, go get something to eat, and then come back to the buses, and then we're going to go to the church. Well, you couldn't get into line in 30 minutes. Most of us got something to go. Still, it was an hour and a half before we were back together, and we went back to where the buses are, and oh, wouldn't you know it, there was a bike race in Zacapone that day. And our buses got sent away. I don't know where. <laughs> good times. Eventually, we catch up with the buses. We did go uh, down here to Our Lady of Fatima Church. There is, it really is a lovely mountain church. Um, we had a beautiful mass. Father Loris Grell celebrated the mass. Father Ryan Kaup was a homilist, and earlier that day, we had gone through the museum right across from Presentation Church in Vadovice, where John Paul II was baptized and raised and was an altar server. And right across the alley was his old apartment that's now a museum, and we went through it, and he saw this quote on the wall that I had actually seen, and there's, there's stuff in there everywhere because JP2 wrote and he wrote and he wrote and he wrote, but this quote had grabbed both of our attention, and he happened to preach on it that night, um, and it was really, truly beautiful. Here's the sisters in the middle of kind of the country, county fair. These little things here are actually, it, it's a s sample of the sort of things you saw. It's smoked cheese 
Um, I tested it for you. It's really good. I care. So that was day two, Chestahova, Vadovice, and then Zacapone. The next day was heavy. We got to see what the world looks like when you leave out God. Here's our group at the gates of Auschwitz. As we're all going in, and I'm, I'm the leader of this group, and I'm concerned because I'm taking teenagers in to a very solemn place. But I didn't get a, a lot of rules. I said, turn off your phones, or better yet, just don't bring them, and be quiet. They were so amazing. Our young people understood what was going on and where we were. Um, this is kind of just a sample of the barbed wire that happened. Auschwitz-Birkenau was considered one camp, but they're about six miles apart. Auschwitz was a former military post that they began it with. Birkenau, come back. Birkenau was just built as a concentration camp in the middle of a field. Its purpose was death. And truly, it, it is a horrible place. Um, Here are our priests gathered together, and in our next slide, we're going to talk about what this place is. And here we go to Birkenau. I gathered them together. This is a regular part of pilgrimage, okay? You get to the place, you gather together, you explain kind of what it is, and then you begin to meander through. Up here, our group had gathered together again. Here's Paulina. She was our tour guide at the time, and she's also a regular tour guide at Auschwitz and was explaining things to us. This is in Birkenau, here and here. And right here is our group standing in front of one of the crematoriums that the Nazis had destroyed on their way out so that nobody would know what they had done there. Um, truly a sobering place, but it was incredible to see our young people there and to see how it affected them and to see how it brought them into a different sort of spiritual journey. And then back at Auschwitz, this is building 11 which is the starvation bunker where Maximilian Kolbe offered his life for another man. <clears throat> Again, I didn't give them rules. Our, our kids saw this picture being taken of all of our priests wanting to stand there, and they began to ask, why are they doing that there? And because they love the priesthood, and they love what their brother, Father Maximilian, did for them. And our kids just started to go and pray in this incredible spot. And it got me too, watching them. It's truly a, a daunting but beautiful thing. And then we came alive and we're taken to a Legnitza. Days in the Diocese is my favorite part of every single World Youth Day pilgrimage because it's where you go to a nearby place and are brought into the homes to stay and really understand the culture of the people. I was able to tell them before we left that Poland's different. These are people that have suffered for hundreds and hundreds of years. There are tons of saints from Poland whose remains are still there. We're going to see these things. But these people have remained faithful in a way that maybe nobody has through their suffering. And we just looked at the suffering. And then we get here to Legnica. It's also called Little Moscow among the Poles, because it's the last place the communists drew out of. And it's the most hospitable, wonderful, joyful place. Truly incredible. Um, here we are at St. Jack's for the opening mass, or Jakusz in Polish, or Hyacinth in the Latin. The first Dominican to come to Poland um, one of my favorite churches in Krakow is the Dominican church that he founded. And that's what this church is named after. And if you go right up here, it's the most recently approved Eucharistic miracle in the church. And we spent five days there. Right there. Many times having the opportunity to just go and pray with Christ. Present in a unique way. Here's the Archbishop of Legnica saying that opening mass. Here's one of their old castles in town. 
Uh, looks a lot like my neighborhood. So much of that throughout the whole of Poland and Europe, of course. Day two in Legnica, our families had told us, uh, we're going to get on some buses and we're going out to the country. We have this little pilgrimage church we go to. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm from the country and about eight miles out, we had a place that got closed down and made into a mission and then just a pilgrimage spot for us. And it, let's be honest, it had a really nice sanctuary, but it was a hut. The demons don't want this to happen. The computer demons. It's the most beautiful Baroque church I've ever been in. <laughs> ever. And again, I'm blessed. The church sends me out for reasons I don't understand to lead these things. Um, here it is on the outside. You walk in, and this is just a little bit of how getting the taste of it. You get up here in the sanctuary, and the statues are the Te Deum. It's just incredible, the detail. Here's a small piece of the organ. And here we are at the Mass, um, lots and lots of priests, lots of our priests. Uh, the group from St. Michael's also spent days in the diocese in this town. Um, they were actually hosted by the parish of St. Jack's. So it was really incredible for all of us to be together. At the end of Mass, after the procession, the organist just jumped into some stuff from Phantom of the Opera and wasn't the most liturgical thing, but it was powerful. It was cool. Um, like no World Youth Day I've ever done, the liturgical music of Poland was amazing. And yes, it brought emotion, but emotion that drew you straight into the heavens. Beautiful, beautiful Gregorian chant and a real uh, orchestra behind a lot of this stuff. And then some just simple chants. Jesu ufam tobie. Jesu ufam tobie. Which is exactly what we see on the bottom of the Divine Mercy shrines. Jesus, I trust in you. The next day, we went to Rokla, which is kind of the large city in the region down there. Um, and this is the beginning. We were some of the first people there. We filled this up. They had a great concert. Um, Sister Christina, who won the voice in Italian, was the main person there. She was early, and then they had a really classical European group that kind of went next. They're very, very famous. It wasn't for young people. Um, but we stuck it out, uh, some of the last to leave. And we also got to know our Polish host pretty well there. Um, our kids remember me a lot from this day. Um, I have a microphone now. I don't need it. This is for Father Heaslip's recording. We're in the train station, and it's chaos. And there's this lovely Polish lady yelling into a bullhorn. Nobody's listening. Everybody's talking. I'm like, mm. And there's a whole lot more than just us there. There's lots of pilgrims, and the train station's full. And I got a chair, and I set it down, and I just yelled, and boom, quiet. And our kids were just like, whoa, I thought he just yelled at us. <laughs> and we got them going, and got them organized in their groups, and got on the trains, and made it to Row Claw. It, it was a really fun day. Our last full day with them was Sunday. The families took you to their parish church for Sunday Mass. And then they had a, a festival for us in the park, um, this is just one little snapshot from there. This is one of our hosts, Malvina. Um, many of us are friends with her still and keep in contact. Um, spoke wonderful English. And I, she's this young person that was really happy and guiding us everywhere. And I asked her, I said, are, are you a tour guide? Is that what you do? And she's got at least one PhD uh, in some sort of medical research that deals with the spine and and works with people during spinal surgeries. Your typical tour guide. <laughs> Kevin, I put this here for you. Um, truly enjoying that last day. The food was awesome. 
What'd that cost? Maybe a dollar fifty? Yeah. Awesome and cheap. Two of my favorite things about food. And here we are ready to depart from Legnitsa. We had a closing mass. Here's the Eucharistic miracle. Some of our kids praying. This is the hardest day because you become close with these families and then it's time to go. Um, and you're exchanging emails and everything else, but it's really, really hard. And I want to share, this young man is Levi Dibdahl. Levi is 17. He caught cancer when he was 8 or 9. Many different treatments going through. And finally, they had to do a bone marrow transplant. And in the bone marrow transplant, he caught something called graft-versus-host disease. And it's relentless, and it's nasty. And it seemed very unlikely that Levi was going to be able to go with us. And then suddenly he got better. And it, it really was this incredible thing that he did. And he was the most joyful pilgrim we had. All he wanted to do was see the Pope. And he wasn't angelic. He didn't float from place to place. He made us better because he would roll up to the stairs and not say anything. And our guys would just come along, grab a wheel, and up we went. Europe's not super handicap friendly. He made us lots better. Um, a couple, three weeks ago, I and several others were there at Levi's funeral where uh, we remembered him. And we prayed for him and his soul. And we were very thankful for what he did for ours. Changed the pilgrimage. Changed our kids. I think I can. I think I can. Can I blame you for this, Father Heslip? And now it's time to do our work and go see the Holy Father. Off we go to Krakow. Krakow has a main city square, at the corner of which is St. Mary's Church. At another corner is the most ancient church in the city from the 11th century. Little bitty thing. And then there's this little bitty thing. Here's from one of the side altars. Right, Emily? It looks just like St. Teresa's. Here is kind of the view as you walk in. I will always love this crucifix. How high up there do you think that is, Kevin? More than 50 feet up. 150 feet up. That's more than 50. Uh, and then I brought it down here so you could see the high altar. The high altar actually is like a cabinet. It closes. And each piece in there is hand-carved wooden. First thing taken by the Nazis when they invaded. And remained in storage rotting until 1989 when the communists finally gave it back to the Poles and they redid every single piece. And we were blessed to go in there several times. I think they just left it open the whole week of World Youth Day. Just an incredible place. And kind of also nice because it's a point where we could meet and go. Meet and go. Adoration there through the night and early into the morning. Our priests would sneak off at 5.30, do a holy hour, and be back in time for us to go do breakfast or whatever. Wonderful place. Day one there, first day, we went to the Divine Mercy Shrine. I didn't put any pictures of the shrine here, not because it's ugly. Well, maybe. But this is the convent where St. Faustina lived, on the same grounds. And we got to the grounds, and we went to the tour guide, and Father Hadavi was the chaplain with me. You dirty, dirty. <laughs> <sighs> and we went up to this young lady, and we were like, okay, what do we do? And she says, all groups go this way, and we know the convent's that way. And Father Hadavi and I have been on a few pilgrimages. So I stood and talked to the lady while he took our group the other way. <laughs> and then I said, oh, my, my group left. 
and she had to get to the next group. It was really a thing of beauty. <laughs> Ish. <laughs> uh, Come over here, Father. <laughs> Try harder. There you go. Can I ask you to pray for me? <laughs> Thank you. So here we are in the convent. My favorite moment of this day, um, Sister Mary Faustina with the Christ the King sisters went with us, um, and they were letting priests and sisters go through the velvet rope up to the relics of St. Faustina and just have time to pray in the chapel, and she just knelt there weeping. It was beautiful, beautiful. Right next to, and of course, here's St. Faustina talking to us. She's walking around all over that place. Oh, same habits. It's truly a beautiful thing. And right next to it is the new shrine to John Paul II, which is a really cool building and church. We were met there by this guy, Bishop Conley, and toured the church. One of the things we saw there, this is the cassock that John Paul II was wearing on the assassination attempt. You get in here a little closer, you see the blood in here, you see one of our pilgrims praying at that spot. Um, one of many things you could see there, the original marble cover of his tomb is there in a chapel. And we left there and went to another half hour lunch that lasted about five hours for the lines, and it was hot. Bishop Conley, Father Hadavi standing under their umbrellas, Father Kalp showing us how it's done. Uh, that's what you gave us those headbands for, Jeff. The next day began catechesis in what was called the Mercy Center. Um, so here we are with 35,000 English-speaking pilgrims, great speakers here, Sister Mary Faustina here. And that evening we had a concert with Audrey Assad and Matt Marr. Um, that turned into a holy hour. And you see the monstrance being processed in here by Bishop Barron, who then gave just an incredible homily afterwards. Within the, the procession, you see our own seminarian Drew right there, Drew Schwenke. And then kind of afterwards, what things are looking like post-concert. Um, I think it's fair to say our young people really amped up after this night. It was one of their favorite things. The next morning, uh, catechesis again. Here's this guy that keeps following us, making us take pictures with him. Here's the beginning of the mass procession. You might recognize Bishop Folda there. And we went from there to a big open field within this, actually it's a park, Bologna Park, in the city of Krakow to wait for the Pope, and it starts pouring. People handle pouring different ways. Dominic stares. And Father Leo and one of our guides are just smiling. Same with these young ladies. This handsome gentleman just fell asleep under an umbrella. <laughs> I've been on these pilgrimages before. It was a good time to take a nap. And then this guy breaks up my nap. Everybody gets so excited. They see all the... And I look up. Oh, the Pope. A special moment happened there. Um, Levi, who I mentioned earlier, was able to go up to the handicap section, and as the Pope drives by in the Pope mobile, he didn't stop and go talk to him, but he made direct eye contact and stopped and waved and blessed. There are a lot of stories about Levi throughout his sickness. He was not a starstruck person. At one point, he was in the hospital down at Children's Mercy, and his mom said, Levi, the governor's coming. And he's playing his little device of video games, and he's like, the governor of what? <laughs> the governor of Nebraska. Well, that night, 
or th he comes in with his police escort, and he actually played video games with the police while the governor stood there with a the teddy bear kind of wondering what to do. <laughs> Bo Pelini was one of his good friends. This moment, Levi was starstruck. St. Peter is with us. The next day, his Stations of the Cross, we have catechesis at the Mercy Center again. Our Lady of Perpetual Help was there helping us in the worship. Again, amazing, amazing music. This is the Holy Father speaking out of the window of the Archbishop's residence in Krakow, where John Paul II would go to the window and address the people when he was the Archbishop of Krakow. On my first trip there, I was very lucky. Twice I was able to go to this residence and go to the Archbishop's private chapel where John Paul II was ordained because it was a secret seminary at the time. Kevin was unable to join us for the Stations of the Cross because he took a bullet for me and stayed back with a young sick person, but he snuck over and got a picture of the Pope at the window. Well done, sir. And then it's time for the pilgrimage walk and walk and walk. This one ended up being about 13 miles. Again, hot. The pavement wasn't actually that much better because you're just out there in the sun. And here we are at the beginning. Look at those smiles. I didn't put any smiles at the end. But we're walking through the city, and we end up getting past the city, and we're walking down a highway, and walked about nine miles of highway. Um, you need to suffer on these pilgrimages. It's not a vacation. And it's a suffering given for those in need. And we got to Campus Misericordiae where we're going to have the holy hour and the, the just time with the Holy Father where he told us to get off the couch. And that's when we arrive and we're setting up our camp. First time I'd ever seen them hand out candles at this night. Got a beautiful sunset happening. One of our pilgrims here and then it's getting darker and sister up there. This is what it looked like throughout the whole place. Millions and millions of people with these candles. Beautiful moment with the Holy Father. Again, we did evening prayer with him. He gave us words of wisdom, and he spoke in Italian. But we had priests with us who spoke Italian. And normally you've got the little thing in your ear, and you're listening to 92.4 or whatever, trying to get the translation. No. Nope. Father Rowling and Father Morin just told us right there what was being said. Next morning is Mass with the Holy Father. Way up front, there's a big stage because there's a lot of priests to get going there. This is us, Rise and Shine. We're not yet thinking about rising and shining. It's a long sleep on a hard ground after a hard day. Again, it's really, really hot. So there's the sisters with two of our pilgrims covering them. Here, Kevin not only takes good photos, he's an architect, and we took a whole bunch of sheets and just whatever was available to us and put together a shelter for our kids. As other people were leaving, we knew we were going to have to wait for a while, so they were able to shelter under there. And here's just an example. This is a swap meet, if ever there was. It's international. Hey, what, what do you have? What can I get? What can I give you? Um, and sometimes people, we had one pilgrim who really wanted this hat, and she walked up to the guy, and he was German, and she's like, oh, what do, what do you want for the hat? Do you want an American flag? And she has this full-size American flag, and he's like, I want your watch. Moving on. <laughs> and then one of our pilgrims traded her watch for it. It was a cool hat. After that, we left the next morning to go finish our pilgrimage, in Prague, we stopped in Brno on the way, and there's no you actually when you're over there, it's just Brno. Bishop Conley riding on the bus with us, we stopped at a random gas station in the Czech Republic, where of course we ran into Chris Stefanik, who was the MC the three mornings at the Mercy Center. Um, got our picture taken with him and just got to meet him a little bit, and then we went to the sisters where our Marian sisters come from in Brno. They gave us a tour of the grounds. I made a friend for life. She's hilarious in two languages. 
At least I think so. Something funny in Polish. And then we had mass in their chapel. They were falling all over themselves to be hospitable to us. Um, they fed us. They just loved the experience. And then finally, Prague. Um, this is the most beautiful city I've ever been to. It's probably the, the biggest major city in Europe that wasn't bombed during the war. And so it still retains all these beautiful things. This is the church where we had our first mass. It's a church dedicated to Our Lady. And there's the mass itself. Um, beautiful scene of the coronation here on the high altar. This is the famous Charles Bridge here. And then this is the infant of Prague right there. And finally, this was the gift I was given, um, the most gracious gift I've ever been given by our, our pilgrims. Right here is St. Mary's Church in the background, our group, and then they signed it for me. I meant to bring it tonight, and I forgot, so I made a quick slide so you guys could see it. Um, truly a moving experience. Truly something that was ask, seek, knock. And a great, incredible time with our Holy Father. I'm actually out of slides, so it's okay that it's gone bad now. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Thoughts, things they want to share? Maybe they, you've been on a pilgrimage that you want to share um, a moment with. So many moments with such amazing people. The, the Polish people have suffered, but they are so faithful. There's such an incredible culture of faith there that, that the people were my favorite part. And I've retained several friendships from Poland that I hope continue. Thoughts, questions? Not everybody at once. Yes. I'd, I'd been to Prague er, about 10 years earlier. Uh, I was with a group that went with Father, um, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank, um, the exorcist, help. Barry, th thank you. Anyway, Father Barry, and uh, we just got back not too long ago, and the people there were so gracious, and I stopped and talked to a woman that worked in a coffee shop basically in our hotel and I told her I said your town is so beautiful I said it's changed so much and she said did you come before or after the re the revolution and I was there afterwards and uh, I said but you didn't have all these stores and all these you know all, all these things that you have now and she said no and then she started to explain and I I'd seen the pictures of the revolution and the kids that burned themselves because they uh, were so upset with the government and things that were happening. And um, she started telling me, she, she had very broken, broken Polish and English, I mean. And she said, my arm, and she kept going like this. And I said, well, you don't have to continue. We call that your hair standing on end. I know this is really hard for you. And she said, no. I want to finish. She said, I am so happy you are interested. Most people come over for a, um, you know, for a good time. And I said, no, I am interested, and, and I'm just so thrilled that you've kept, I said, are you Catholic by any chance? She said, yes, I am. And I said, I, I just, you know, love it that you've kept your faith through all this. And she, I just... Her and I must have talked for about 20 minutes. It was late at night. I had gotten home a little bit earlier than everybody else. but And everyone was like that. I mean, they just they want to tell you about their country, what what they've been through, but also the neat things about it. So I, I was just I was thrilled. Deep cultural sharing happens on these experiences, there's no doubt. Anybody with any questions? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. I heard it talk on the TV show. Uh, but no, uh, he said that uh, they learned all about it and everything, and then they ran into a doctor from Australia that went into deeper detail on the DNA they'd taken from it. And it amazed me that they could take that, get that much from just a small sample. But he, that, that the fact that he said that, that, they, there was a paternal DNA there, but no paternal DNA. That was 
really, I never even thought of it that way, and it was it was astounding. So, indeed, it is astounding. Um, I was able to talk to one of the original doctors before they give it to doctors who are not faithful people, uh, and that's hard to do in Legnica, Poland, by the way. But um, yeah, they came up with the exact same results as they did in Lanciano, Spain. Universal giver was the blood type. Um, just it, it takes your breath away a little bit. It should. I'm, I was uh, directing it, and I knelt before the Eucharistic miracle, and I, knowing that my God was there, and I just told myself, don't think about logistics. I'm thinking about logistics. But eventually the moment took over for me, um, and just being there with our God um, was really incredible. Anybody else? Father Kelly. Sure. Um, Father, Father said, uh, I'm talking about kind of extreme pilgrimages, and it's true, I am. How do we do that here? I think there are several opportunities. Um, and first, I would say the pilgrimage is to strengthen us for our life in the parish. That's where the Christian life is lived. But there are lots of opportunities here. Go to the Carmel. And walk as far as you can. Maybe it's their driveway. That's a pretty impressive pilgrimage walk, actually. It's a long driveway. Go to St. Greg's. Go out and see Our Lady of Guadalupe in Denton. Go to the Holy Family Shrine. There are several places within the Midwest that are great pilgrimage sites. Some in Kansas, many in Nebraska. Iowa has a s several. There's um, a, a priest who was with us, who's now incarnated up in Wisconsin, Father Andrew Kurz, constantly leads pilgrimages. I, I don't remember. The, it's Our Lady of, not cheese, but it's something up in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, but he's doing that all the time. And he walks regularly for other people's intentions. Also, Find out people that are going on pilgrimage and give them your specific prayer intentions. It helps the pilgrims. It focuses them as they go. And I include in that the March for Life. Tell our young people, please pray for me. Give them $20 to help them get there to eat some food, but then say, but I need you to pray for this intention. Please. And you're a part of that pilgrimage. Your intentions are shared. Do you have other thoughts on that, Father? Or? Yeah. What a pilgrimage that is, right? Where we just walk through the church at each of the stations asking, seeking, finding both the cross and the empty tomb. There's another question over here. Let me bring the microphone to you. I listen to Catholic radio all the time, and I think I caught over uh, uh, Life on the Rock, the kids, you were talking about food. The kids, said their, their host family that they stayed with, was it groups they stayed in? And they said they'd come back and they constantly, they, there was, it was like their grandmother feeding them. They'd, they'd give them something. And if you turned them down, you know, it, oh, it, hurt, it hurt their feelings. So you'd have to stuff yourself. Yeah, I, I teach them, guys, you got to accept their hospitality. And I have many stories on this. And I tried lots of new things. The Polish food's amazing. But some of my friends over here, maybe give one little experience of the food, if you would. I've never eaten a beet in my life. And I, I was ready to die without eating beets. Um, but I had the most amazing beet soup. Uh, I guess there was a day when we went to, I think it was Krakow the first night. Yeah. And they gave us, it was supposed to be soup, but it was just like lettuce in a bowl. So I thought we were supposed to eat it, but, <laughs> but you're not. It was like, I don't know. I don't even know what kind of soup it was, but it was like a precursor to like, 
the soup that was supposed to go in it. So I ate all of my like salad, <laughs> but it was supposed to be for the soup. And then I was really embarrassed because they were like, did you eat this? And I was like, no, <laughs> I, I didn't. <laughs> Somebody stole it. <laughs> Um, I guess my best food experience was there was a lot of ice cream in Poland, and our host family would feed us so much, and they, they would be like, they called me Pocahontas because they said I looked like Pocahontas, so our host mom was always like, Pocahontas, please eat more. You must eat, <laughs> and she made me eat ice cream for breakfast, so. <laughs> Never a bad thing. Yes, my host mother um, made these huge meals for 20 people, and her daughters made fun of her. One's in med school, one's just starting college, and they're like, my mother never cooks this much. She loves you, she loves you. And you cannot tell her no. <laughs> okay. And it's course after course after course, and she, and I just, I ate, and I ate. And she would just look at me like, you're not skinny, I know you can eat more. <laughs> so I did. Uh, to, <laughs> Two high school guys at the same place, and oh, we left so full every day. Anybody else? Yeah, in the back here. Yeah, there was. Um, we took a moment on the bus ride to Brno um, to just stop and say, hey, What's caught you so far? And I was, I was careful not to say, what's caught you spiritually? I just wanted to know, what's been an amazing experience for you? Every single answer was spiritual. From the hospitality of the people brought me so much into what we were doing that the mass was different. To... I came on here, I thought for the right reasons, and I thought I was being joyful, and then I met Levi. <laughs> and I understood there's a joy deeper that I have not yet found, and it's through suffering. To a mom that said, I gave birth to twins, and I thought I had conquered the world, but that pilgrimage walk was more. <laughs> Everything bearing down on me the heat, the struggles, and I conquered it because I walked with Jesus. So many testimonies, and every single one had a serious, serious spiritual component to it. Anybody else? Friends, thank you so much. I'm glad I got to – did I cut you off? Did you have a question? Okay. Okay. Um, I'm so glad I got to share it because it was an incredible moment for me. But also I think we need to share it because pilgrimage is who we are. It's not this thing we do. It is the life we're called to live. And things like this are just a reminder of that. And again, it should bring us back to Christian life in our home parishes. And I hope if you had young people from your parish that were there, they've come back and shared some of that with you because it really was transformative. So I thank you, I thank Gianna's, and I thank Father Heaslip for inviting me, and I hope you had a great time. Father, do you have anything? Um, first off, thank you. Much appreciated, Jeff, that was very good. Uh, I remember the thing that sticks out the most in my mind in his words is when three million people knelt down before the Blessed Sacrament, naturally and seeing that at that wide of scale does remind us of the universal church and that we're walking with Christ uh, wherever we are whatever country we're in I just wanted to close with uh, just uh, two announcements um, one announcement deals with uh, next month's coffee house and that'll be on November 20th with Catholic Social Services own Father Kubat he'll be talking about his pilgrimage with Emanuela Emanuela is Saint Gianna's daughter and so hopefully he'll be sharing some good graces that, uh, that he received and that his group received 
<clears throat> from that experience, from that pilgrimage. And so uh, please do come. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Gianna's again for all their hospitality. I would especially want to thank Jake for getting all these things set up, getting the speakers set up, and getting everything all ready to go. Uh, much appreciated. That's a big help. Also, I wanted to uh, advertise a, um, a retreat that Father Coulter and Father Holmes uh, are going on. And uh, just to read a little announcement from them, that way for those who are interested in going on um, an, uh, a larger scale pilgrimage, uh, they can have the opportunity to, to do that. Um, so I'll just read the little message for me, or for you. Uh, Ron Holmes and I are excited to announce a pilgrimage to the shrines of France, Spain, and Portugal on July 5th through the 14th, 2017. Sites include Lourdes, Loyola, that's where St. Ignatius was born, uh, Santiago de Compostela, that's the, uh, the famous pilgrimage uh, of going to St. James' tomb, uh, Fatima, that'll be the 100th anniversary of Mary's appearance to the children, and the cost for this 10-day pilgrimage is uh, 3535 uh, per person, and uh, there's a few extra fees here and there, but that, that fee includes airfare in that. Um, just to contact Father Coulter, and you can get his information on the website if you're interested more in that. But again, all of this is to remind us of a fundamental part of our identity as Catholics, and that is that we're pilgrims, that this life has a destination that's beyond this world. And sometimes we need to see the pilgrimages that other people take and some of the experiences they have just to remind us that we're on a journey. We're on a journey to, to our Lord. But thank you again, everyone, for coming, and let's close with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our merciful Father, you gave us life, and even more wonderfully, restored us to life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us to always follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit on our journey through this world, so that we may see your face. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and pray in the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Thanks so much, everyone.